So now we're going to describe how that genetic information that's stored in the DNA molecule is transfer to other molecules in the cell who actually carry out these instructions. So the molecule that's mainly responsible for doing all kinds of stuff in the cell is the protein molecule. Now, when we discuss proteins in the context of nutrition, it was mainly to provide us with nitrogen as well as energy. But now we're going to talk about protein in terms of their actual function in the cell, and it actually has a lot of functions. Pretty much everything you can think of that happens within a cell as well as between one cell and another cell occurs via the interaction of proteins. Now, what the DNA does is provide that set of instruction that then has to be translated to make the protein that you want and then the protein is the molecule that's actually going to do the job. So as a background on proteins, we have discussed that before it's a polymer of amino acids. Now the way those amino acids combine is as follows. You remember that an amino acid looks like this. It has an amino group, which is this NH2 group, and it has this carboxylic acid group, which is the COOH group. And then in the middle, it has what we call the R group, that's called the side chain, which has a number of different carbon-carbon chain, and there's 20 different ones here corresponding to the 20 unique amino acids that we need to survive. Now, the way the protein molecule is formed by amino acids is by the formation of something called a peptide bond. And that works by a molecule of an amino acid bringing in its OH group from that carboxylic acid part of the molecule. And then another amino acid coming in with its amino group donating its hydrogen. The hydrogen, the oxygen, the hydrogen combine to form water. And then the rest of the two amino acids then combine together through this new bond that's formed between the N and the C atoms. And that's what we call the peptide bond. If you do this, with many amino acids, then you have a chain of these peptide bonds and we call it a polypeptide or another name for it is a protein. Now, how does the DNA molecule transfers the information from its code, the four bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine into this amino acid code of proteins. Well, it turns out that DNA uses this three base coding system. In other words, every three base of the DNA and sequence of three bases in DNA codes for one of the amino acids. So an example here is for the amino acid glutamine. You might have heard of it as a supplement that people take to build muscle mass, but the amino acid itself could be synthesized in your cell if the DNA sequence has either the sequence CAA, so cytosine, adenine, adenine, or CAG, which is cytosine, adenine, guanine. So both of these through the machinery of the cell will get translated into making or synthesizing the amino acid glutamine. And so through that construction of that codon and a series of them in the DNA, you end up getting a series of amino acids that are then combined to form a protein molecule. Now the sequence of the amino acid in the protein is what we call the primary structure. So it's just kind of a sequence of these different amino acids tied up together. This would be an example of it. These are all three letters that are abbreviation of each of these amino acids, proline, alanine, aspartate, etc. The primary structure of the protein is not that critical. What's more critical is when these primary structure starts to interact or fold within itself to form more complex structure called secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. So the secondary structure is just some arrangement of these amino acids that fold on its own. It's sort of like if you have a wrapping paper and you fold it into a shape of a flower or a bird, that's really what we want to think about in terms of the com more complex protein structure starting with the primary structure. So the secondary structure is a little bit more complex than the primary structure. It forms some building blocks we call alpha helices and beta sheets. And then those 
building blocks combine together to form this more complex structure called a tertiary structure. And in many proteins, that's the end of it. But then some proteins, these tertiary structures then combine together to form even larger building blocks we call quaternary structure. Like in this particular protein, which is the protein called hemoglobin, a protein found in red blood cells that's responsible for carrying oxygen, each of the protein consists of four subunits. Each subunit is one of these molecules right here. So it's, a, as you can see, a very complex molecule containing a lot of different atoms. Now, the three-dimensional structure often tells you how the protein will work, what its function will be. Again, going back to hemoglobin here, it's actually a really useful example of that. This is hemoglobin shown in what we call a space filling model, but we can also look at it more in a cartoon shape like this. So each one of this two like structure with a circle in it, that's one subunit. So there's four subunits here called alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two. Now here's the interesting thing though. It, in each one of these, you can see here also in this picture, there's this reddish molecule that's buried inside that little cleft of the hemoglobin protein. That's illustrated as a circle here. And here we zoom in on that group to look at exactly what it is. This is what we call a heme group. So the molecule itself is illustrated here. It might be a little hard for you to see, but there's actually a drawing of a molecular structure here with carbon and oxygen all forming this ring. Inside that ring though, it's an iron ion that's stuck there. And the iron is coordinated by this group around it. So the whole thing is called a heme group. Now, why is this so complex? Well, the whole point of this iron is to picked up oxygen. So the iron is positively charged. Oxygen has some electrons in it. The interaction between the oxygen and the iron is what keeps that oxygen around. And then because this protein is found in red blood cells, as the red blood cell goes through the circulatory system in your body, it will carry oxygen from areas where you have a lot of oxygen in your lungs, all the way to other parts of your body that require oxygen in order for the cells to be able to generate energy and to live, right? And so this is an interesting concept because the structure of the hemoglobin, you know, the way that heme group is nestled inside that cleft of the hemoglobin protein is important. So the shape of the protein has evolved to accommodate that heme group. And the heme group has evolved in order to be able to bind to oxygen. So the whole thing has a purpose. In other words, it's the shape serves its function. Now here's one of the most critical things about this, this shape. If you have what we call a mutation, which is basically just a change in the primary structure of the protein. So let's say one of these amino acids get changed instead of the standard glutamate at position six. This is one of the common mutations we see in hemoglobin. Glutamate in position six, which is this structure right here, it gets changed to this much shorter amino acid called valine. So I don't know if you can recognize this, but this is your amino group. This is your carboxylic acid group on this side. And then this is the side chain. So the side chain originally is this blue color one, now becomes this red color one. You might think, what's the big deal? This is a pretty minor change. However, if we look at that three-dimensional picture again of the molecule, this is now color coded where blue means that the that part of the molecule is nonpolar whereas red means that that part of the molecule is polar. So here's the mutation. Originally, that part of the hemoglobin molecule is what we call hydrophilic or water living or polar. That's another, they're, they're all meaning the same thing. Now, when you change that glutamate to the other amino acid valine, you notice that the color has changed now. It becomes bluish, which means it's now nonpolar or another word for it is called hydrophobic or water fearing. So you change from something that's polar to nonpolar. That creates a huge problem because the nonpolar portion of this now would like to interact with other nonpolar parts of hemoglobin. Because remember, we have that rule where nonpolar will mix with nonpolar, polar will mix with polar. So the nonpolar will all mix together and they sort of just clump together because nonpolar interactions are nonspecific. So they kind of just like a glue clumping together. When they clump together, that actually prevents the hemoglobin from doing its job of binding to oxygen. In fact, so much of the hemoglobin clumps that it changes the shape of the red blood cell. This is what a normal red blood cell would look like when it's, the hemoglobin is mutated 
at position 6 into valine, the clumping results in deformation of the red blood cell shape so that it looks like a sickle or a crescent shape. So this is often called a sickle cell condition and many times it will lead to anemia and that has to be treated. So it becomes an actual serious condition just by the mutation of one amino acid, okay? Out of this whole structure here where there's hundreds of amino acids in there. So just keep that in mind how sensitive these structures are. Even one change can cause a very significant problem to the organism.